I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Lobo Tigre, founder and CEO of IndependenceSpeculator.com. Thank you so much for being here online with me once again. Thank you, Charlotte, and especially for inviting me back to talk about something that I think is really important and not discussed enough. Yes, we are here today to talk about ESG, which we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago where you started to go into it, and then we decided that it was too big to continue on there. So we're doing a full conversation all about ESG, which I think is going to be great. And to start off, I want to ask you a little bit about the history of ESG in the mining industry and how it's developed, because I think it's been around for quite some time, maybe just under some different names. Yeah, that is an important point because people are, you know, suddenly waking up and discovering ESG. And there's, there's two ways to go about that. One is there is something new, and that's why we're having this conversation. It's not just the same old that it's always been, and it's important, and we need to get into that. But it's also not true that nobody's ever cared about anything anymore. Now, uh, clearly back in the bad old days, you know, there was a lot of pollution associated with mining and railroads and lots of industries. Uh, you know, it just was a completely different world back then and what people cared about, the values of not just businessmen, but everybody and what was accepted was completely different back then. So there are reasons why people see mining as this nasty, dirty, you know, polluting business. But the, the reality is that as the world it's, and society itself has changed, standards have changed, mining has changed. It's been a long time since you could just, you know, dump stuff anywhere across the countryside and get away with that. Um, that's only the E part. So what I'm saying is, let's make a more recent cut. What I'm saying is being a good corporate citizen, that's in one fashion or form that's been around for a long time. It's not a new idea. So you know, let, let's not get too carried away with all the latest fashions and all the terminology and so on. It, it's already there on the table. There are known you know, best practices in the business and so on. That's all there. But it is important to recognize that things are changing and sort of the degree to which you have to participate. It's sort of like, um, it's, it's honestly, it's a paradigm shift, Charlotte. The, what is acceptable now is very different from what is what was acceptable even just 20 or 30 years ago. It's getting to be as different as what was acceptable, say, in the 80s and 90s versus the 1930s. It's that kind of phase shift. That's why I think this is really important and why we should talk about it. Yeah, so let's talk about some of those changes that are happening. Um, as you mentioned, it's a really different landscape for ESG right now. And I think part of the shift that's happening is, you know, we talked about this before, it's going from, you know, maybe you put a slide in your presentation, you pay some lip service to it. Now you actually have to be doing something. So maybe let's talk about that and your thoughts there. Sure, yeah. I mean, honestly, it used to be where you could go around as a geologist and hand out candy bars to the locals, you know, and <laughs> and they'd be happy and that would be it. But everybody is connected now. I mean, you can go to the poorest village in Africa and somebody's got a cell phone and a smartphone, right? You know, they can tell where the juniors are drilling. They can read their press releases <laughs> and try to get ahead of them on the ground out there. Uh, and this is happening all around the world. So a world in which the locals could be thought of as ignorant villagers, that just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so you have to pay attention to this. Um, but there's kind of a funny thing about this too, in terms of what's different there's actually an, an advantage to the mining industry that other businesses don't have. And that ESG, environmental social governance, it's not just about pollution, right? Ratcheting up the standards on the E side, I see that more as a progression rather than a big revolution. But the S and G, those are big things. That's part of what makes this such a different phase change. And so the good news is about sort of what's changing, what isn't is that the mining business, okay, it's typically hired around the world, lots of young men, because that's who wants to be miners. But that's not all that they hire. And in terms of uh, you know, plant managers and other personnel, there are a lot of advantages actually to hiring women. And a, an interesting thing is as the world has changed and as more women in, around the world have gotten higher levels of education and more, or even just more interest in not, you know, being not just in the home and cooking, you see a lot of women entering the workforce in mining businesses around the world before people started talking about ESG. I saw this 20 years ago. And miners found that 
you know, you put a 20 year old kid in some 300 ton truck and he's like, oh, big truck. I'm having fun here. You put a 20 year old woman in that same truck and she's careful. You know, she's like, oh, this is a big responsibility. <laughs> I got to be careful with this thing. And um, women tend to have more roots in their local communities. They often will have children, their family, they're less mobile. And so they'll stick with the job. If you train a woman to be a plant operator of some kind or another, you're more likely to retain her than you are some 20 year old young buck who might go to your competitor for a dollar more an hour or something like that. So a lot of stories I can tell you here, Charlotte, but what I'm saying is that the mining industry globally already has a leg up on the sort of S and G, or at least the S part, because um, as a business person, you would recognize the advantages of hiring women in particular. And as far as minorities go, you know, you don't generally find a new mine under, you know, downtown Chicago, or if you did, it wouldn't be worth it because it's, the land's worth more as real estate. You're going off into the hinterland. You're going off to where, you know, people's skin may not be as white as where your headquarters is located. So who are you hiring? You're hiring them. So you're already hiring what we would call minorities here in the U.S. or Canada, but are not minorities in their country. And you're hiring more women because they tend to be more stable. You don't have as much turnover. They take better care of the equipment. I've been, uh, I've been to mine plants where the majority of the plant operator is female. That's really interesting. And this is before everybody was talking about that. So I see advantages here. And part of the message I'm trying to tell the audience is, you know, don't panic. It's not like all of a sudden the mining business is going to be impossible. Um, but you really have to make sure you do these things and you have to not just talk the talk you have to walk the walk you have to hire accordingly you have to be sensitive and if you don't and it will cost you more in some cases but if you don't embrace that cost and if you don't do the right things you will get shut down you'll get protested or the government will come and find you at fault or your own shareholders may hold you accountable for failing to live up to esg mandates i mean just look at what's happening in the oil business you know, the shareholders are telling oil companies to stop producing oil. You know, it seems crazy, but that's the world we live in. So this is this is really serious, and you you can't give it lip service anymore. That's the phase change here. Is you really have to do it. And the good news is that this can actually be good business for the mining sector. Now the G part is the tricky part. You know, how much taxes you're going to pay. Um, but this is happening, Charlotte, and I I would encourage the people in the business to be open about what they're doing because they have good, good things to say about. And I would encourage investors to not just look at the corporate presentation and how many pages look green and have flowers and things like that, but to actually ask management about these things. And, you know, what is the ratio? How many are you hiring? You know, what are your benefits to your employees? What are your wages compared to those of others in the areas that you're working? Yeah, this is all really important. And you know, just to give people an increasing idea of how important it is, one of the things that you started to bring up when we were talking last time is how this could really change the landscape of which countries are attractive, where it's easier for mining companies to do business. The Fraser Institute is one place that tracks that. So let's go down that road and get your thoughts on, on those things. Yeah, I think this is particularly important today and this may be the reason why we're having this conversation, at least in my mind, because there's an attitude out there and it's a well-founded attitude. It's an attitude I share to a significant degree that it's worth um, paying more for stocks and companies that are investing in the safer mining jurisdictions. You know, the ones at the top of the Fraser Institute ranking, Canada, certain US states, uh, in places where you can work, there's rule of law, you're less likely to be shot at on your way to the mine right, or catch Ebola or some horrible disease. <laughs> you know, th there's a reason why there's an attitude for certain, you know, primo mining jurisdictions in the world. But at the same time, these are the very places that are gonna be tightening the thumbscrews more on ESG mandates. You know, if you're, let me put it this way. When I talk to people in villages in Africa and various African countries and so on, and I talk to them about the mining and the, or the mine coming and changing their lives, changing their town. And you know, there, there would be maybe cyanide heap leaching over there. Are you worried about the cyanide or you know, carcinogenic you know, chemicals or things? And most of the people, they look at me and say, are you kidding? You know, Cancer, that's a problem for old men. I need to feed my family 
tomorrow. So bring on the mind. You know, I don't, and it's not that they were unaware or stupid or didn't, you know, think about these things. It's just that it just didn't matter in their scheme of priorities. So well, you've got a country that is still lifting itself out of poverty. Are they really going to mandate, you know, really high first world level ESG standards over creating jobs? I don't think so, or not so much. Uh, they'll probably go for the G part, at least in the form of taxes. They'll, they'll, we're seeing more and more uh, countries, and this is very common. Commodities prices go up, metals prices go up, countries increase their taxes on miners. That's, that's par for the course. But you may see, Charlotte, that in the not too distant future, these very countries that investors flock to now because they're safer, may become less safe because of just ridiculous ESG mandates. I mean, if, if if some politically correct province in some northern country we won't name were to say, okay, 50% of the population is female, so 50% of your employees need to be female. Well, what if there aren't 50% of the population who's female that's interested in working in a mine? You know, how do you fill your, your ranks with 50% females if they don't want to be there? You know? So, and I'm not trying to insult women or saying that women won't do this. I'm just saying that if you mandate something that's difficult or impossible for a minor to comply with, you can shut them down just as thoroughly as if um, you know you you banned their mining or something like that. So this is a rising tide that I see as whatever we may think about it, whatever our attitudes might be about women's rights or minority issues or whatever, uh, it's happened. Okay. So so set aside whether it should happen or not, it's happened, to, you know, as a given. And then you need to assess the risk. What is this going to do to these businesses? And one of the key ideas I'm trying to posit is that in the so-called first world, in the developed nations, you may see more onerous, higher levels of ESG risk than in the developing world. And that could become so extreme in some cases, I, you know, I had a kind of extreme case, but it, that rising differential could actually invert your priorities. It could actually be worth the risk of confronting Ebola in some place in Africa, as long as they don't regulate you out of business with ESG mandates. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a major potential change that investors, you know, can you start preparing for that at this point? Or are we, you know, should we be waiting to see more of what happens there? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to handicap, you know, which countries are going to be the most impossible to work in five years from now. I, I think that would be uh, pretty difficult to do. But the trends are there on the table. And um, right now, where that translates to is actually less in sort of, you know, government mandated impossibilities that shut you down, but more in your relations with the local communities. And when the local communities have support from a government that's more sensitive to these things, it empowers them to be more demanding. And that can be First Nations tribes that want you know, a bigger agreement with the company on local hiring or so on. Or it can be these communities in Latin America that put up roadblocks and so on. If, if the government won't remove illegal roadblocks, there's nothing else that's gonna, you know, the company's not gonna go in and hire a private army and remove them. That would be a disaster. So you could have, uh, in Peru, there's a case right now where there's this, this company, it's got 400 miles, sorry, kilometers between its mine and its port, and there's one road. And every community along that road is up in arms, uh, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you can't just pay off these one, this one group to go away and not bother you anymore. You have to deal with all these communities. Or you know what? You have no mine. That, that mine was shut down. And how are you going to make agreements with, with dozens of communities along 400 kilometers of road when you, there's no alternative? They, they know they have power. And what I'm saying is, you know, the government is not shutting down the illegal blockades. The government is tacitly, if not overtly, on their side. It makes it very difficult for the companies to negotiate. So rather than give you a trend, okay, here's what the world's going to look like in five years, Charlotte, I just tell the audience to pay very careful attention to what governments are doing now who they're supporting, you know, how much more are companies having to do now? And I will also, it, so just watch that, you know, watch it as it changes. And maybe it's not quite as useful as being able to predict the future, but don't have blinders on. Don't think, okay, it's 
Quebec, so it's great. You know, what if Quebec goes off the deep end? Or it's Nevada, so it's great. My blinders are Nevada's great no matter what. Well, you know what? That could change. You know, particularly most of the population in Nevada is in Las Vegas. It can be the, the, the tail that wags the dog. So, and they vote, right? So rather than a five-year vision of the future, my point is watch this now, watch what's happening now. And maybe one more thing is to the companies, to the CEOs and to their investors and their boards of directors, um, I think it's worth being preventive on this. I think it's worth uh, taking some hit to your margin to make solid, you know, happy campers out of your local stakeholders. Now, I, I understand that business is for profit. I think it is a dangerous uh, thing to blur the line between nonprofit and for profit businesses. But the world we live in today is blurring that line whether we want to or not. And I would rather, as a shareholder or a potential shareholder in your business, I would rather invest in you knowing that you're doing everything reasonable to make sure this ESG stuff doesn't turn around and bite us on the posterior than to, to feel like I'm gambling on who knows what unknown ESG lightning might strike us next week. Okay, I think, I think that gives people a good idea of where to start. Obviously the future is uncertain. I think that one thing with ESG, at least for me, that gets a little bit tricky is that it's so hard to quantify who's doing a good job and who's phoning it in, not doing such a great job. So do you have any advice there on what investors can look at to understand that a company is actually doing what they should be doing? Yeah, well, it's one of those things where, well, one, you can't just count on a province or a state or something like that. There, there are certainly instances, uh, say in the Yukon, where some people have been able to progress and others have just gotten smacked down by troubles with the ESG issues in local communities and so on. Same all around the world. Uh, Mexico is one really diverse country right now where some people are making great progress and other people are just frozen in, you know, in regulatory and ESG hell. Uh, so one size doesn't fit all. How can you tell who's going to succeed? The only reasonable answer, Charlotte, is look at who has. So if you've got a mind builder who's working on version 2.0 of something with that they've done before, it's in the same community, same type of deposit, they know these people, they've succeeded at creating jobs for them before, that gives me a lot more confidence backing that team than even some highly competent team that you know used to work in Africa and now they're working somewhere in Peru or, or, or whatever. Um, how much more useful guidance can I give you than that? Again, don't just look at the presentation of the website. The only other thing that I can say that's really useful, and I don't know how useful it is to everybody, is go and look. You, you actually can do this. And you don't have to be me, by the way. I, I, I'm a newsletter writer, so I get invited to go see companies and things. But one of the things I will do, don't tell the companies, is I'll go before my appointment. I'll go and I'll tour the town or the local area and then go meet management after I've already talked with the locals and made my own sense of what it's like. And anybody could do that. It, and you might say, oh, well, that's expensive. I've got to travel and so on. Well, you know what? If you want to invest millions of dollars, if you're going to be making serious investments and you want to make millions of dollars, it's worth an airplane ticket to go and see if the reality on the ground matches what's in the shiny corporate presentation. Uh, you know, COVID has kind of put a wrinkle in my travel over the recent years, but that's what I do. I go and I proof these stories to the degree possible on the ground when I can. And of course, I look at the rocks, the geology and everything else too. But a big part of what I really get out of the travel is actually what we are now calling ESG before we just sort of informally called it social license. You weren't supposed to say that, uh, but it was understood that you needed good social license to be able to work in most parts of the world. And that was absolutely one of the main things that I went in person to go check out. And if you can't, of course, you can hire me as your due diligence guy to help you out. But those, those are the answers. The, the easy ones are look at who's done it already in that same area and then go check for yourself. You can. Yeah, and this is exactly what I was going to ask you next was you're obviously when you evaluate a company going through your list of criteria that you want to see and what role does ESG play within that? It sounds like it plays actually quite a big role among all the other factors that you look at. 
it is playing a bigger role than it has. I'll admit that. I'm I'm sort of I love the geology. I, I get excited about seeing different formations in the rocks and it's beautiful sometimes, Charlotte. It's just an amazing experience sometimes to go in a mine tunnel and see the whole thing light up like stars in the night because of the sparkly sulfides and so on. It, I, I love what I do. But the ESG side, it, it is such a showstopper now that whereas before I might have been content to sort of drive by, you know, meet whoever I happen to meet, you know, ask them a few questions, you know, see if they look happy, see if there's any protests or whatever. Now I'll spend extra days on the ground researching that specifically because I want to have as good a feel. And I've made mistakes before. I've, I've, I can't say I let the company, you know, lead me around by the hand and introduce me only to their friends. Um, but I, I have had times where I came away with a very wrong impression of how supportive or not supportive the local community was. So this has become an increasingly important part of my own due diligence that I'm willing to spend time and money to get right. Okay, and maybe now let's look at it a little bit from the company side, because we all agree ESG is something that should be focused on right now. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, companies still have to run a business, right? And they don't want to give everything away as you've been talking about. So how do those two sides interact? How can companies best navigate that? Sure. I mean, this ultimately comes down to math, Charlotte. And if you can sit down with the community and say, look, you each want a million dollars, there's 50 of you and the project is worth $40 million. That doesn't work. I mean, it's, at some point, people should see reason and there should be some kind of balance. But I, I got to say, there's also just a lot of people that are still stuck in an old fashioned mindset of, you know, maximizing margins just on the business side and not looking at what happens if you have no margin, if you get shut down for failing on the ESG front. So I am saying that it is worth, a, you know, certainly a few percentage points on a robust IRR in, internal rate of return on a project to beef up your ESG in advance. Um, it, you know, I can't give everybody a right number, but just, just look at your margins. If you've got fat margins, think of it as an investment. You know, you, you don't want to be shut down. You don't want robots. You spend a billion dollars or two building a giant copper mine in Peru, and then suddenly you can't mine it. You know, how, how much worse is that for shareholders than if you had just said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to slim, you know, on a big project like that, even you know a small percentage, a fraction of a percentage on your margin is a lot of money for the local community, and you can make these people happy. So, you know, you can't just give away the farm. You can't run yourself out of business. But the degree that you can reasonably um, run your business profitably and return to your shareholders and your investors, and inoculate the project against disruption by allocating more than you might have in the past to ESG. I think that's important. I, I, there's no one size fits all here, but I do think there is um, a reluctance and, and maybe with some reason, you know, mining is so tough. You think this is gonna be great. You've got a 30% margin, it'll be fine. And then you build it and it turns out, you know, the, the rock is harder than you thought. You're spending more energy grinding it or there's some contaminant you have to remove. So now 30 becomes 25, becomes 20, you know? And then, well, so, but suddenly we, we promised to give away 5% of our profits to our, to our local community and it becomes a non-viable project. So I understand not wanting to give away too much in advance, um, but, but you've, you've got to understand that if you don't take this seriously and whether you should or shouldn't have to, if you don't, if you don't play nice, they will take the ball away from you and you won't play at all. I, I, one simple thing, this may sound stupid, Charlotte, but I'll put it out there because it drives me crazy. And it's so simple is a lot of these companies actually contribute a lot already um, through local involvement. They'll build a clinic or a school for the local village, that sort of thing. But they often contribute a lot more through the taxes they pay, special royalties on mining. And that goes to the to the capital of the country and it gets redistributed to the political insiders and their friends and so on. And even if some of it does trickle back to the community, the company doesn't get any credit for it. Like the mayor says, look, I put this new road in or I've, I've electrified our lights in town and now we have street lights. Well, the money for that came from the mine, but the locals don't know that. They think the mayor did that, the government did that. 
So companies and their investors need to make sure that they're getting credit for what they already do. And anything they do do themselves directly, make sure you put a big brass plaque on that door that says, you know, gift of XYZ mining company. That, that's my, my stupid but simple thing to say. It may sound silly, but people forget, you know, people who were there when the decision was made, when the ribbon was cut, they move, they move on, they forget. Put that big brass plaque on there, you know, put your company logo on there. Make sure that the locals understand that you contributed materially to their well being. Yeah, I mean, of course, they should be taking ownership of, of things that they do that are positive for the community like that. And I think, you know, maybe on, I don't know if this is quite the flip side, but on the flip side of companies that may be forgetting to show what they're doing, we have kind of a trend toward companies that are doing a lot, or they're telling us they're doing a lot, like these all electric mines that we're hearing about, companies that want to be totally carbon neutral when they're mining. Maybe we could get your thoughts on those as well, because that kind of seems like way on the other side. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, there are mines. I remember being at a, at a zinc mine in Spain, in southern Spain, where the whole fleet had been electrified from the beginning, you know, decades ago. And it just worked out. I think they were near hydropower. I don't remember the exact setup, but it, it was actually an economic business decision to um, have electric trucks and they had rails like a tram in a, in a town that has that overhead little rail to connect to the electricity. And, and so, you know, they had cheap power, they had that ability. And I think the main thing was that it allowed them to uh, spend a lot less money, capital investment on ventilation raises and other things to keep the air clean in the mine. If you've got these big trucks bellowing out diesel fumes in this confined space underground, you spend a lot of money ventilating that, and, you know, keeping people from asphyxiating. So if you can do that all electric, there's, there's a real reason to do that. So pushing back a little bit here, Charlotte, and saying that you know an electric fleet can be a pretty good idea uh, for other reasons. If you can get ESG credits for it, so much the better. You know, would, would I, it goes back to what we were saying before. If you can, if you have a high margin project and you can still have a reasonably high margin project and go electric and reduce your carbon footprint, that may make sense. If it's going to drastically reduce your returns, though, if it's actually, you know, visibly a bad idea, like this makes a great mine into a marginal mine, oh, but it looks better, or it's more politically correct, you know, that's not a good idea. Don't, don't go that far. And show your shareholders, look, you know, this is unreasonable. This is too much. I, I do think that is a legitimate concern. But, but again, you know, don't get stuck in your old thinking. I think there is a lot of stuff that comes under the rubric of ESG that can have advantages, you know, business advantages of its own. And, uh, you know, like, like the thing with the women really impresses me, it strikes me, you know, things happen when you hire women in small villages in rural parts of the world, you know, suddenly if, you know, if you have a traditional macho culture and so on, but if the wife is the biggest breadwinner in their family, suddenly you don't want to beat your wife as much. You know, she's the one who's paying for your beer. That's a terribly sexist, horrible thing to say. But, you know, I've seen this kind of dynamic in the world where it completely changes the power structure uh, in ways that, you know, some UNICEF program would never dream of being able to doing. You know, it just, and my thoughts are wandering here because I get, I get, lost in my stories and so many things I'm seeing. What I'm saying is don't make a stupid business decision. You are a for-profit business. And of course you have to make sure that you make money and return for shareholders, or you will not have a mind. But don't think that everything ESG is necessarily just an expense. There are a lot of these things that have legitimate silver linings. Uh, you know, they, they bring benefits other than just getting the ESG mob off your back. Uh, so, so look at it, look at it seriously. And again, remember, you know, you lose that social license. It, you know, ESG can be an all or nothing proposition in the end. And, it's, and it's, it's bad enough not to be able to go forward if you do go forward and you build a mine and then you get shut down. You know, that's just the worst possible outcome. So it, it, is, it is worth, and for investors out there, my fellow shareholders out there, it is worth accepting a slightly lower, but still good margin in order to make sure that ESG creds are not just talk, but actually 
you know, helping materially benefit the local communities where the mines operate. Okay, yeah, that was actually helpful. I think you articulated what I was trying to get at where, you know, it does still have to make sense as a business decision. It's not automatically good because you've done some kind of ESG thing. So that that helps a lot. Um, as we're getting a little bit closer to the end here, I want to touch on a topic that I was telling you about before we set this interview up. I told you that when we publish ESG content on our site, on our YouTube channel, I think it's really important, but typically we don't get, you know, the excited investor response to this type of thing, to my dismay. So I had this impression that your average retail mining investor doesn't care as much as they should about it. But I was wondering if you could tell me, do you think that's true? Where, what are your thoughts there? But how do we get this important information out to that audience if they're not interested? If people, you know, if I'm an old curmudgeon and I think ESG is just the latest load of dingoes kidneys and I just tune out every time I see that, then I'm not gonna see, you know, important guidance on how to invest for profit, uh, you know, based on the changing trends in ESG in the world. So <laughs> I get it, it's difficult. Um, I'm not sure I have a great answer for you, but I wrote an article on the changing trends in ESG and how important this is. And I, I don't remember the exact title, I don't have it in front of me, but it was basically ESG, the most valuable bullshit in the world or the most valuable BS in the world. Can I say that on TV? I don't know. And I figured your old curmudgeon who doesn't wanna hear about ESG, he would see the BS in the headline and say, oh yeah, I agree with that. And so I'll read that because you know he's, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? And hopefully I was able to get useful information to such people who might not otherwise have read an article about, you know, if we publish something responsible sounding, you know, navigating the current trends in ESG, risk assessment, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. You know, a lot of people just won't read that. So I'm not sure how I can help you, Charlotte. I didn't say is pick a really snazzy headline for this one. For sure. And as we're wrapping up, is there anything that we didn't cover here that you think is relevant for investors when they're trying to approach ESG today? Yeah, but that could open up a whole nother big conversation, maybe for another time, Charlotte. I think one thing to keep in mind is, and again, for our typical audience out there, you know, you may not want to hear about the green revolution. You may think it's all another load of dingoes kidneys and it shouldn't be happening. It's all because of these government subsidies and so on. But it is happening and the government subsidies do exist, whatever you or I may think about it. And that's part of the E, but it's also just part of the larger zeitgeist. The world is electrifying. This is an investable trend. And so playing your ESG cards right and getting a company that does it right, I think can become a win-win. And the reason why I say this is important is because part of this is the NIMBY I'm, we're throwing lots of acronyms in here, ESG, NIMBY, and so on. But the same trend that wants more electric cars, more electric everything, doesn't want any mining, doesn't want nuclear power, doesn't want, I, I don't know how they imagine they're going to have electric cars without any mining. I don't know that how they're going to have electricity without any generators. And okay, maybe in 50 years, there'll be enough windmills and solar panels. But now, you know, people need to eat and drive, and, you know, live now. So I see a real, you know, coming together of, of rock and, or what is it? it? Immovable object and irresistible force. You know, we have this irresistible ESG green force and we have this immovable object of not in my backyard. These same people have a contradictory set of goals and desires. That has to change at some point. And I think there are spectacular opportunities for the companies that position themselves to benefit when that changes. And I think the ESG credentials that we've just been talking about are a great, um, you know, it's not a guarantee, but those guys that are doing it right, I, th I think those are the guys that are most likely to be best positioned to advantage when this irresistible force and immovable object of you know, the ESG green agenda and the not in my backyard thing collide and something gives. I think the not in my backyard gives. I think people want to eat, people want electric cars and everything else. So there's going to be mining. And the companies that do the ESG right are going to be the ones that get that social permit to go ahead when other people are held back. 
So that's, I think, a material takeaway for investors out there. You know, watch for this. I think there's a there's a you know potentially really big uh, gains and losses to be had from getting this right or wrong. Yeah, I think that's that's a great place to finish up on. You know, it's about helping to position yourself in the best way you can, and this is one of the the things you now have to take into account. Yep. Okay. So, Great to have you here. As always, um, once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Lobo Tigre of independentspeculator.com.